In this video, I'm going to cover interfacing with the Charles Schwab API in Python, specifically how to make your app, authenticating with it, making API calls, and streaming. The first step for new users is to register for an account. It's important that the email that you use is the same as the one that you have for your Schwab brokerage account. This way, the two accounts can be linked. Then, after making this new account, we can sign in. After you're signed in, we can go to the API Products tab, Trader API Individual, and just double check to make sure that you have requested access. There may no longer be a button for this, but I can't tell because my account's old. Next, you're going to want to go to the dashboard to create a new app. You can see here that I already have an app. For individual developers, you're only allowed one app per account. So I'm just going to show you how to fill in the details if you create an app with a button on the top right. For the API products, we're going to want to select both accounts and trading production, as well as market data production. These are both needed for the full access of the API. Order limit can be zero or up to 120. I'm just going to enter in 120. The app name can be anything you choose, as well as the app description, which is optional. The callback URLs must be HTTPS. So for example, this would work. 127.0.0.1 is the local host callback URL, and it's the only type of callback URL that's allowed for Schwab. You can also use callback URLs with a port on the end. And if you want multiple callback URLs, you have to separate them with a comma. The port on the end is useful if you want to capture the callback, but this really doesn't save that much time. It only saves you from copying and pasting a link into the terminal. After you've filled in these details, make sure to double check them, as if you change them in the future, you're going to have to wait for reapproval. Then you can create the app. After you make your app, your status is going to be approved pending. You have to wait for this to update for a couple days until it's ready for use. Then we're free to continue to the next step. When your app status is ready for use, you can view the details and we're going to want to copy the app key and the app secret. These are right down here. We'll need them later to connect to the API. The next step is to install Python if you haven't already. If you're on Windows or Mac, you can go to python.org and download it there. Or if you're on Linux, you can download it from your distributions method. The latest version of Python will work with Schwab Dev. However, anything over 3.11 is also fine. Next, we need to install Schwab Dev, which is the library that I created and recommend for interfacing with the Schwab API. Your Python installation will typically be bundled with pip. So in a command prompt, you can run pip install schwab dev. Running that command install schwab dev in our Python environment and is now accessible for us to code with. Next, let's make a folder to put our project in. I'm just going to make mine on the desktop and call it demo. Now we need to open an ID. I'm going to use VS Code, but you're free to use whatever you want. From the IDE, we're going to open this folder that we just created. Now that we're inside of the project folder, I'm going to make a new file, and I'm just going to call it main.py. Now from here, we're going to need to import a couple modules. The first module that we're going to need to import is schwabdev. Then we need to create a client object. So let's make a variable, and we'll set it equal to schwabdev.client. Earlier, we copied the app key and the app secret from the Schwab developer page. The first parameter is your API key, and the second parameter is the app secret. If you have a callback URL other than 127.0.0.1, then you can add it here as the next parameter. Now that we have our client, we are free to make API calls. So I'm just going to print the value immediately. Let's get client.quotes and AMD. Then we need to call .json on it to get the JSON parse response of the API call. Assuming you added your API key in secret and your app status is ready for use, you should be able to just run this and get a quote. And I'm going to show this in a minute, but I'm going to move my app key and my app secret into a .env file. If you're using a GitHub directory, then you're going to want to include the .env file inside the .gitignore so that it's never pushed to GitHub, though my use is mainly just to hide it for the video. We can make a new file called .env. And inside here, we're going to add several variables. App key equals your app key here and app secret. And you can put your app secret there. I'm going to add mine here. You can also add other environment variables or secrets that you want to keep outside of GitHub. But remember to include this file in your gitignore so that it's never pushed. Now that our keys are inside the .env file, we need to make some modifications to our original main.py. We need to import OS and the .env module. If you haven't already, you need to install this separately since it's not included as part of Swab Dev. You can run pip install python-.env. I already have this installed. Then we're going to load the environment variables from the .env file by calling load underscore .env. And in our client, we can replace these 
with the call to OS to get the environment variables. So we can call os.getenv. So that we can get logged messages, I'm also gonna import the logging module. And I'm gonna set a logging level via this command so that we can get extra outputs from Schwab Dev. Now I'm gonna demo the sign-in process. From a new terminal, we can run this file with Python. You'll notice here that it could not load the tokens. Here it's gonna make a new database. And you'll notice that a link has been pasted in the terminal. You're gonna to wanna to follow this link and sign into your Schwab account to authenticate with the API. Here we are on the sign-in page. Remember that this is not your developer account. You have to agree to the terms and conditions. Check the box, continue, accept. You have to select an at least one account to link. Continue, done. And then we can take this link at the top of the page, go back to the terminal, and we'll wanna paste it in here. SchwabDev will now update the tokens, and then since we got a quote for AMD, you'll notice that we just printed it straight to the terminal. Now that's all you need to do to authenticate with the Schwab API and start making calls. I'm going to go over some more calls in this video and get into streaming. However, if you just want to read the documentation, there's a link in the GitHub directory of SchwabDev. Down here, we can go to the documentation, and here we can see extra instructions on how to use the client, make all the API calls, start with streaming, and make orders. Now let's go into some other calls. One of the most important calls is to get the linked accounts. This returns the account number and account hashes of the linked accounts. You'll need the account hash to place orders and get account details. This call can be made with client.linkedaccounts and we're just gonna immediately get the .json of it. Then from the return value, I'm gonna get the first instance since I know that I only have one linked account and we're gonna get the hash value. To get the account details for all linked accounts, we can make a call to client.accountdetailsall. But if we want the details for a specific account, we can call client.accountdetails with the, with the parameter account hash, and I've added fields of positions. Now let's run this. This is printed a lot to the terminal, and I probably can't show any of this, so I'd recommend checking out the doc documentation for an example of what this returns. In the documentation, we can see in the API calls, a call to account details all returns this large schema of a bunch of different values pertaining to the account. With the account hash, we're also able to get details for a specific account and place orders. Now I'm going to show you how to place an account order. I'm going to remove this code and I'm going to paste in an order schema that I've already made. If we go back to the documentation, in the order page we can see other examples of order formats. If you don't see an example of the type of order that you want to place, you can make an order on a different platform such as Thinkorswim and then make a call to client at order details with the associated order number and that will return the format for that specific order. At this time orders are only supported for equities and options and there's a limit of 4,000 orders per day. With this order we can send it to the API with this method client.placeOrder using the on the specified account hash and the order object. This response cannot be converted to a JSON, and instead we need to check the headers in order to get the order ID. This snippet allows us to get the order ID. And for this example, I'm just going to print the order ID. Now let's run it. This is blurred, but we can see that there's an order ID associated with this order. Now I'm going to remove the place order call, and I'm going to get the details for this order. I'm going to take the number that's in the terminal below and paste it here. If we run this, we can see that the order details are printed below. Since this is a fake order, I'm now going to cancel it. We can also replace an order and preview an order. Some other API calls are getting the orders for all accounts, getting transactions for an account, getting the transaction details for a specific transaction, getting preferences. This is mostly just used for streaming. Calls from here on relate to the market data side of the API. I demoed client.quotes earlier, but you'll notice we also have client.quote. Client.quote is just for a single quote, and client.quotes supports multiple quotes at the same time. Next, I'm going to demo getting an option chain. With this call, we can get the option chains for Apple with a contract type call and range out of the money. Now let's run it. We can see that this is quite a messy output. If we look at the documentation for SchwabDev, we can see a much cleaner formatted example. We can also make a call to the option expiration chain so we know when options are going to end. There's also a call for price history. Here's a demo to get the price history of Apple with a period type of year. In the documentation, we can again see a better output of this. We can also make a call to movers, which allows us to pick a specific index or across all stocks and find stocks that are above a certain volume, trades, percent change, across different frequencies. A call to market hours gets us the time that different markets close. Market hour is just the singular version of market hours. A call to instruments gives us different data about a certain stock. We can also make an instruments call using the CUSIP. Now let's move on to streaming. In this video, I'm just going to call the synchronous version of the stream. The difference between the synchronous and the asynchronous version is that the asynchronous version connects to the current async event loop, 
whereas the, the synchronous version makes a separate thread and starts an asynchronous event loop there. Receiving data from the stream is very easy. The default of SchwabDev is to just print all the data to the terminal. But if we want to do something useful with it, we'll need to append it to a list. I'm just going to make a list called data. Then we can make a response handler. Here we can see that all I'm doing is appending the response to the data list. But the response is just a string. So we'll need to parse it with JSON. To do this, we're going to need an additional import. Then we can call json.loads. Next, we need to make a streaming object. We initialize the stream with client as a parameter. Then we can start the stream, and let's pick something to subscribe to. Referring to the documentation, we can see that down here, there are a lot of different streamable assets. Level 1 equities, options, futures, futures options, and forex. And there are also several more. For this example, I'm going to stream from level 1 equities and forex. I'm just going to copy from here and edit to what I need. Let's change this to just stream AMD. And I'm also going to subscribe to forex. I'm specifically subscribing to Forex because it's 24-7 and I'm currently outside of market hours for level 1 equities. Since our responses are just repeatedly being appended to the list, we need to parse them out. This will consume the responses from the data list. I'm going to import time to slow this down so I don't use as many resources. The stream normally responds in 1 second increments. Now let's run this. You can see here that we've logged into the stream and we're now streaming Forex data. You'll notice that there's nothing for level 1 equities because we're outside of market hours. However, when you first subscribe to a stream, you'll get one response containing all the data elements. I'm going to press Ctrl-C to cancel this. It's important to note that there are some differences between the types of assets that you can stream. All of the level 1 data streams changes, meaning that the data that you're going to receive is going to overwrite the previous examples. So for example, if you first receive this information, and then the second thing that you receive is an update of this key. The current data is going to include the previous parameters that did not change. For book and screener data, these are all going to stream whole, which means that everything in, is included in each response. Let's look at an example. Here we can see a market snapshot along with bid and ask side levels across various markets. Here's an example for screeners. This is very similar to the movers call. There's also chart equity and chart futures as well as account activity, which stream all sequence data. Let's look at a return example. Here we can see a response example for chart equity. You'll notice you're given a timestamp in various fields. Key number one is the sequence number since pre-market hours. Essentially, each one of these responses is a candle. You can see the key value translations right here. Account activity also streams sequence data. The examples here are the responses from when an order was placed, routed, then canceled, and then the cancel routing. Now let's look at some additional parameters that you can use for the client. We already know about the app key and the app secret. You can change the callback URL, but keep in mind that it must match one of the callback URLs that you've added to your app. You can change, you can change the location of the tokens database if you want to, but the standard location is fine for most people. The timeout refers to the amount of time to wait for requests when API calls are made. The call for auth function allows you to inject your own authentication flow. There's an example in capturecallback.py. This is a pretty long file, but what it does is if you have a port on the end of your callback URL, it will open the link, then you can follow the steps, and the callback will re be redirected to a local server that captures the callback URL. Essentially, you just don't have to copy and paste it. But if you have a different process that you want to do, or you want to do something like send a notification to your phone that you need to refresh the token, you can do this here. You'll notice that encryption is missing from here. It is a parameter that you can change, but I forgot to include it up here when I published the documentation. When you look at this page, you'll see the parameter. Encryption allows you to encrypt your tokens. The tokens are important to encrypt because the tokens control access to your account. But by default, there is no encryption. In the encrypted DB setup file, we can see an example file that can be run to set up your database for encryption. This will generate a code that you should save locally. You can put this code in your .env file or somewhere else that you want to keep safe. But keep in mind that you'll have to pass it in as a parameter with SwapDev in order to unencrypt the database. Underneath the synchronous version of the client, you'll also notice that there's an asynchronous client. The only difference in parameters here is the parse parameter. The parse parameter is useful because it will automatically parse the responses into JSON. However, this can make it harder to check the response codes and whether or not the call is completed successfully. Here's an example of concurrent API calls. We can see here that we're getting 
quotes for all of these different tickers in parallel. Then the results are printed below. I really only recommend the asynchronous client for people who are already familiar with asynchronous operations. Some important things to note about SchwabDev are that multiple clients can be run at the same time. This means that you can have two instances of SchwabDev running at the same time, but keep in mind that they must share the same tokens database file and that you can only have one streamer at a time. Another thing to note is that you're going to have to sign in every seven days. The refresh token that you get after signing in is only valid for seven days. It's very important because it's used to refresh the access token, which is valid for 30 minutes. SchwabDev handles automatic refreshing of the access token, but for the refresh token, this has to be done manually. If you're running a script that you don't want to interrupt, then because multiple clients can be run at the same time, you can just make another script that calls client.update tokens and force a refresh token update. Then your script that depends on an updated refresh token will grab the newest refresh token when it deems that it's expired. I've covered a lot in this video about SchwabDev, but I don't have the time to cover every call. In order to get more familiar with the API, I'd highly recommend reading the SchwabDev documentation. And if you run into any issues, you can always visit the troubleshooting side of the SchwabDev documentation. Otherwise, I'd highly recommend that you join our Discord server. If you want to ask questions about how to use SchwabDev, get help, help contribute to SchwabDev, or if you want to discuss strategies with other people. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching.